Now that we've learned bones and bone markings, um, we're going to look at those connection points um, in a little bit more detail. So what we're talking about really now is our joints or our articulations, um, kind of what gives your skeleton its kind of mobility and flexibility. Um, this little lecture is going to focus mostly on how joints are classified um, and then just some general anatomy of the fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial joints. Um, I've got some videos for you guys um, that are going to, we're going to look at a couple of kind of selected synovial joints as kind of exemplars, um, and I've got some videos that'll help with that, um, and then um, in another class we'll deal with kind of what happens when things go wrong, um, because joint injuries are pretty common, um, and it is important that you guys kind of understand the structure and function of joints, um, so you can treat those injuries. Um, as the video here in just a sec, I'll kind of talk about, give you a nice little example of why this is important. Now that you've learned about the many bones that make up the human skeleton, let's focus on the structures that hold these bones together and enable them to move. Joints, which also may be referred to as articulations. The elbow, wrist, ankle, and knee are all examples of joints. As a healthcare professional, it's very important for you to understand the structure and function of joints so that you can properly evaluate and treat patients with common joint injuries, such as sprains to the ankle or knee. It's essential that you know how joints move and the attachments they form with ligaments and muscles throughout the body so that you can assist your patients. For example, in an ankle sprain, the ligaments reinforcing the joint are stretched or torn. Partially torn ligaments will repair themselves in time, so treatment may simply involve immobilizing the ankle so the body can do its work, undisturbed by movement. In more severe cases where the ligaments are fully torn, surgery may be necessary to repair or replace the injured ligaments. Having a thorough understanding of the structure and function of joints will enable you to properly assess and treat your patients with joint injuries. So an articulation is really um, these ends of the bones, all these different bone markings, um, where they come together and they meet. Um, this gives our skeleton lots of flexibility, lots of mobility that it wouldn't otherwise have with the bones themselves being rigid structures. Um, and also is how your skeleton is held together, how this giant jigsaw puzzle kind of fits together. Um, there are two ways that we classify joints. We're going to classify them based on their function, um, which is really the amount of movement that is permitted by the joint, um, and then we can classify them based on their structure. What are they composed of? What material um, makes up these particular joints? Um, so in terms of functional classifications, we have three types or three classifications of our joints. We have synarthroses or synarthrotic joints, which are immovable, um, so they're permitting virtually no movement. We have amphiarthroses or amphiarthrotic joints, which are slightly movable joints. Um, they're not really permitting a whole lot of movement, but we're getting a little bit of flexibility there, a little bit of kind of give, as it were. Um, and then we have diarthroses or diarthrotic joints, which are freely movable, um, so movement is not restricted in any way. In terms of the structural classification of our joints, we have fibrous joints, which are connected by little dense fibrous ligaments. We have cartilaginous joints, where the ends of the bones are connected by cartilage. And then we have synovial joints, which are really characterized by having a synovial cavity or a joint cavity. In terms of the fibrous joints, they are connected by dense fibrous connective tissue. They do not have a joint cavity. Um, so it's really just one end of the bone connected to another end of the bone through these kind of tiny little dense, really fibrous con connective tissue, um, essentially little ligaments almost. Um, most of the fibrous joints are synarthrotic, um, so they're immovable. Um, the Connective tissue fibers, if they're a little bit longer, might give a fibrous joint um, a little bit of give, but by and large, they're pretty immovable. Um, and we have three types of fibrous joints. The sutures um, are the interlocking joints of the skull, so they're held together by very, very, very tiny little ligaments. Um, you can see here just this little fibrous connective tissue between the different suture lines. Um, you guys looked at these um, when we looked at the skeleton. Syndesmoses, like the distal tibiofibular ligament, um, or excuse me, the distal tibiofibular joint, um, 
has this kind of slightly longer ligament, but still not really very long. So um, not really getting a whole lot of movement in a syndesmosis. Um, and the kind of really cool thing about many of our joints, um, as I said, this is the distal tibiofibular joint. So it tells you right in the name of the joint what two bones it connects, the tibia and the fibula. Um, and then we have gomphoses, um, which is your tooth um, in the alveolar processes of your maxillae and your mandible. So they're peg and socket joints. Um, so the peg is your tooth, the socket is the alveolar processes, um, and the teeth are kind of secured to that alveolar process through the little periodontal ligament. In terms of cartilaginous joints, they are, the bone ends are united by cartilage. They do not have a joint cavity, um, so they're similar to fibrous joints in that way. Um, they are considered amphiarthrotic joints by and large. Um, they have a little, bit of, a little bit of movement, but not really a whole lot, um, but certainly more than most of the fibrous joints. And when we have two types of cartilaginous joints, and really the big difference between these two types of joints um, is which type of cartilage material is between the different bone ends. So synchondroses, um, the bone ends are united by hyaline cartilage. So that epiphyseal plate um, in the kind of growing bones of children uh, is actually a temporary synchondrosis joint. Um, and then the joint between the first rib and the sternum is also a synchondrosis that is um, connected by hyaline cartilage. Um, we've seen some symphyses before. Um, these have fibrocartilage between the different bone ends. So the pubic symphysis between the two pubic bones is a type of symphysis. And then our intervertebral discs between the various vertebrae um, is also a fibrocartilaginous symphysis joint. Um, now, both the pubic symphysis and the intervertebral discs, they have these pads of fibrocartilage between them, um, but that does not mean they don't also still have the articular cartilage because anytime you have a bone end coming together um, with another bone end, it's going to get covered with articular hyaline cartilage. Um, but the symphyses have fibrocartilaginous pads kind of between them sandwiched in there. The synovial joints are most of the joints of the body, and pretty much all of our limb joints are considered synovial joints. Um, they're all diarthrotic, so all freely movable, um, and really their defining characteristic is the fact that they um, are separating the bones with a fluid-filled synovial cavity or joint cavity. Um, if we look kind of at just some generic kind of, here's a generic synovial joint, um, you can see here's the joint cavity here, and really this joint cavity is really all about reducing friction. Um, we have several friction reducing structures in our synovial joints, um, but one of those big ones is the joint cavity. Um, the joint cavity has a capsule around it, that's the articular capsule. Um, there's an outer fibrous layer of the articular capsule, which is dense irregular connective tissue. Um, and then there's an inner synovial membrane, which is loose connective tissue. And it's actually what secretes the synovial fluid, which is what fills this cavity. Um, and we get synovial fluid basically from filtering out our blood plasma. Um, so not only is this a great friction reducing structure, there's also um, phagocytic cells inside the synovial fluid, which can help kind of clean up debris, um, really good lubrication, um, helps nourish the articular cartilage um, that covers both of the bone ends here and here, um, which is hyaline cartilage, of course. Um, and then there's also nerves and blood vessels associated with all of these joints. Um, the blood vessels are what supplies the filtrate the plasma um, that eventually becomes the synovial fluid. Um, we have kind of mechanoreceptors that kind of monitor the position and stretch of our joints so that we don't weigh, we don't overstretch them. Um, you'll see we have a ligament here on the outside of the capsule. Um, so we actually have three types of ligaments that we find associated with synovial joints. We have capsular ligaments, which are actually a thickened kind of part of the fibrous layer of the articular capsule. We have extra capsular joints, which is what this one is. It's an extra capsular joint. Um, so they're found outside of the articular capsule. And then we have intracapsular ligaments, which are deep to the capsule um, and are typically kind of wedged in between 
um, the articular, the fibrous layer, and the synovial membrane. Um, we have some other kind of friction reducing structures that we find at synovial joints. Um, some of your joints will have kind of little fat pads um, for some extra cushioning between the fibrous layer um, and the synovial membrane or between the synovial membrane and the bone. There are other joints that have menisci or articular discs, um, which are these big fat pads of fibrocartilage, which kind of help improve the fit of the bone ends, help stabilize the joint, reduce wear and tear. Um, so your knee menisci are a great example. We put a ton of wear and tear, all the weight of the body um, is on our knee joints. Um, and so we have these menisci that kind of help reduce kind of that stress and strain that are constantly on our knee joints. Um, we also have bursae, which are these little kind of sacs of f fluid, um, little balloons basically, um, and they're friction reducing structures as well. Um, so we'll find them um, kind of under ligaments or under tendons, under the skin, any place where a couple bones are going to rub together. Um, and they really are like little water balloons between the ligaments and tendons and the joints. Um, so that way we have kind of nice smooth movement. Um, we also have tendon sheaths like this one here. Um, we're particularly going to find lots of tendon sheaths um, around joints where there are lots of um, muscles crossing over the joint, um, like here in the shoulder joint. Um, and essentially what a tendon sheath is, it's just an elongated bursa that's been wrapped completely around a tendon um, and again just helps us reduce friction so we have nice smooth movement around our joints. Um, there are three factors that help stabilize our joints. Um, one of them is the shape of the articular surfaces, so the, the shape of the bone ends. Um, by and large, it's a pretty minor role. Um, it does play a role and contribute um, to the stability of the joint. So for instance, the coxal joint, the hip joint, um, has a much deeper socket in the acetabulum than the shoulder has in the glenoid cavity. Um, and so the hip joint is much more stable than the shoulder because of that. Um, there's also the number of ligaments and the location of the ligaments um, still playing a, a fairly limited role, um, but ligament joints that have lots of ligaments that are really strong tend to be more stable than joints that have only a couple or, ha or have really loose ligaments. Um, but really the biggest factor that stabilizes our synovial joints are our muscle tendons that cross over the joints. Um, so when we talk about, chap in chapter nine, we're gonna talk about muscle tone, which is this kind of partial contraction of all of our skeletal muscles. Um, and how we attach our skeletal muscles to the bones is through tendons. Um, and so with the muscles kind of being partially contracted, that makes those tendons really taut crossing over the joints, um, and that's really, really good at reinforcing and adding stability to that joint, um, particularly the shoulder, the knee, and the arches of the foot. Um, in terms of kind of joint physiology, um, one of the things that we're going to look at is range of motion of our synovial joints. Um, so non-axial joints only allow this kind of slipping movement. They're not really moving along a whole plane, um, a whole axis of movement. Uniaxial means they can move in one plane. Um, so it may be um, a medial lateral plane. That's a flexion extension movement. Um, biaxial um, is movement in two planes. So not only can biaxial joints move in a medial lateral plane, they can also move in an anterior posterior plane. So they can do flexion and extension as well as abduction and adduction. And then we're going to go over all of these different types of kind of movements in class because it's better to demonstrate them. Um, and then multi-axial joints are those joints that can move in three planes. Um, so they can do flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, as well as rotation. Um, and what kind of range of motion a joint has is um, based in large part um, on the shape of the articular surfaces of the synovial joint. Um, we have six types of synovial joints based on the articular surfaces, the shape of the articular surfaces, plane joints, like the intercarpal and intertarsal joints um, are non-axial, so they just have this kind of gliding movement, not really a whole lot of movement, but still considered a diarthrotic or freely movable joint. 
hinge joints. Um, I always think of the door hinge, right? So we have the cylinder here moving um, kind of a, and making a, a joint here with the trowel. So you have the trochlea of the humerus um, into the trochlear notch of the ulna. Um, so they're going to allow uniaxial movement, so in a medial or lateral axis. So they're going to do flexion and extension. Um, the elbow joint, the interphalangeal joints, the knee joint, um, there are several different um, hinge joints in your body. Pivot joints, um, best example really is the atlantoaxial joint between the first two vertebrae. Um, you can see what they are going to do is uniaxial as well, so it's a rotational type movement. Um, and it's really like a bone inside a little sleeve. Um, so the sleeve is a bone or a ligament, um, and then the axle is kind of this rod-shaped or rounded-shaped bone. And so the example here is the proximal radial ulnar joint. You can see that the axle is the radius, and the sleeve is this little annular ligament, and the radius kind of pivots inside uh, kind of rotates inside this ligament. Condylar joints are considered biaxial, so they can move in a medial lateral axis and they can also move in an anterior and posterior axis. Um, and they essentially have two oval articular surfaces between both the bones, um, and one is slightly concave, the other one is slightly convex. Um, our wrist joints are condylar joints, our knuckle joints are condylar joints. And the other biaxial joint is a saddle joint. It really is like putting a saddle on a horse. So here's the saddle, here's the horse. Um, the saddle is the concave surface. The horse is the convex surface. Um, and the saddle goes on the horse. Um, so they're also going to do medial lateral and anterior posterior axes. Um, and you can see um, the carpometacarpal joint of the thumb is a great example of a saddle joint. The most freely movable um, and the types of synovial joints that have the widest range of motion are the ball and socket joints of our hip and our, sh our shoulder. They are considered multi-axial. They can move in a medial lateral axis, they can move along an anterior posterior axis, and they can also rotate along a vertical axis. And so here's the ball, little spherical head, so the head of the humerus here into the cup, which is the socket. Um, so for instance, the glenoid cavity of your scapula. Um, and that's where we're going to stop today. Um, we're going to do some kind of activities um, with range of motion and types of motion, um, as well as just doing some kind of general anatomy type questions. Um, and then in a later class, um, we'll look at a couple of selected synovial joints um, and then also kind of when things go wrong. So um, how we kind of treat things like sprains and uh, torn ligaments and things like that. So I will see you guys in class.